Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and you're all really welcome to this, the, the second last of uh, the Where the Disciplines Meet online seminars, Uniscape seminars uh, for 2022. Um, a particularly warm welcome to Laura Cipriani, who is our speaker today, and our respondent, Antonio Longo. You're both very welcome. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Um, to remind everybody that, that um, the, the format is uh, that we start with a short video that gives us the opportunity to admit people into to the room. Um, and I know uh, because of correspondence with Laura, you were struggling to find a video that you thought might speak to your presentation, but I think you've hit the bullseye. Um, absolutely stunning images and a very stark reminder of the topic of today's talk, um, which is going to be focusing on marginal landscapes in the northeast of Italy that are particularly vulnerable um, to inundation owing to a combination of environmental and socioeconomic 
factors. Um, the paper itself that Laura will speak to in a moment, um, we'll look at the tools and methods that are available to respond to what is ultimately, I think, if I, I'm not um, um, kind of guilty of overstating it, but an existential uh, problem that's facing um, these marginal areas in the, the description of the paper, Laura makes reference to the fact that a lot of focus of research and methodologies um, is on uh, places like urban centers uh, um, that face their own problems in respect of, of uh, sea level rise and so on, but the forgotten coastal landscapes um, that are marginal are the ones that are going to be the focus of um, today's talk. I'm going to hand over now in just a moment to Tessa Mattiani, who is the, um, the director of UNESCAPE, who's going to introduce both uh, the speaker and the respondent. And then we hand over um, to the speaker. Um, we'd ask you to mute your mics during um, the presentation, and then we will have a questions and answers session afterwards. So just to say you're all extremely welcome. We're delighted to see you here. Um, so I hand over to Tessa, thank you. Thank you, Connor, and welcome to you all uh, to this uh, World Discipline Meet uh, Uniscape lecture. We are particularly glad uh, today to have here both uh, Laura Cipriani and Antonio Longo as a lecturer and a respondent. And it's my pleasure uh, to make a short introduction of uh, their profile. So Laura Cipriani is an assistant professor at U uh, at Delft in the Netherlands. She's also representative uh, for UNISCAPE or the network of UNISCAPE for uh, this university. As she taught uh, for 10 years, around 10 years, landscape architecture and landscape urbanism at the U of University of Venice, at the Politecnico di Milano, National University of Singapore, Venice International University, and also at the University of Padua. Um, she is an architect. Uh, she has a uh, bachelor and master's degree at the U of University of Venice and also master in design studies in landscape and urban studies uh, from the Harvard Design Schools and uh, she also has a PhD in urbanism uh, from U of um, and uh, it's very important to highlight that uh, in uh, 2010, she was awarded with the U Marie Curie Research Grant. Um, and also that uh, um, since 2014, she had the Italian Associate Professorship title. But she has also a professional profile. And in uh, 2008, uh, she founded uh, um, a, a landscape urban design office called Super Landscape. And then uh, our discussant, so our respondent, Antonio Longo, he is an architect and uh, an urban designer. Uh, he's an associate professor of urban planning at uh, Politecnico di Milano. And, uh, it's important to remind that he is the director of the master degree course in landscape architecture and land landscape heritage. Um, he works mostly on the relationships between landscape and urban design, and uh, he has coordinated uh, many applied research and uh, funded project concerning uh, uh, land and landscape transformation and management of the relationship between landscape and infrastructure. And uh, I think it's uh, more or less all. <laughs> and uh, we can uh, uh, give the floor to Laura Cipriani for her uh, um, lecture. We are very glad, Laura, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tessa. Thank you, thank you, Connor. I'm going to share the screen. I hope it's going to work. Um, I actually don't see uh, the possibility. Can you please me? The, it is a green. Okay, now uh, I can do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Here we are. Thank you for this kind presentation. Um, I'm going to present you um, some work uh, which are dealing with uh, uncertain lines 
what a landscape of crisis and hope. Um, because due to the climatic crisis, uh, coastal and riverine areas on the planet will face uh, an uncertain future. We all know about it, uh, melting glaciers, extreme events, water scarcity, water floods are actually threatening many areas across the, the globe at all scales, from the planetary scale to the local scale. And uh, sometimes uh, the climatic crisis uh, comes uh, with many other multiple crises, uh, economic, environmental, political, and social crises. And uh, as contemporary designers and educators, we must take full account of this ongoing situation of emergency. Um, I really love actually to talk about the war crisis in itself because uh, the word uh, comes from the, it does have uh, an agricultural root. Uh, crisis comes from the Greek krino, the literal meaning is actually to separate and initially referred to the separation of wheat from chaff, the good part from the bad part, the seeds from husks. So that is why every crisis always brings with it the opportunity and the seed of change. And um, if you think about, uh, uh, about the crisis in marginal areas, actually something that uh, it's not very much explored. In, over the last 10 years, I had the occasion to work on landscape urban projects with my students, in particular in the north side, in northeast of Italy. And if thematic literature and projects are mainly focused on coastal and riverine lines facing large cities worldwide, marginal coastal and riverine areas, mainly agricultural, with low levels of urbanization are partly neglected in the debate. All these coastal areas are actually experiencing problems occasioned by hydraulic risk, subsidence, droughts, seawater intrusion, soil salinization and erosion, industrial and agricultural pollution. I particularly love this image. This image is from Luigi Ghiri, a well-known Italian photographer. He represents the southern part of the Po Delta River, testifying subsidence, a phenomenon which is mostly due to some gas extraction which occurred until the 60s. This photo belongs to a collection of photos and it does have a very interesting title, the profile of the clouds. Um, you know that the clouds do not have a fixed profile line. They're always moving as this kind of fragile landscapes. Uh, they move, uh, they moved in the past, they changed in the past, they changed during the day and they are going to change in the future. And also the idea of clouds, that if you think about uh, there is no water if there are no clouds. Because especially right now, precipitation patterns are actually changing due to climate change. The landscape I'm talking about, they are all marginal territories characterized by recent and old territorial fragilities. Mostly they were dominated by agriculture and fish farming in the past. And these sites are mostly rural even today. The countryside becomes the frame of a system of medium-sized cities which are located along the river. These landscapes are water landscapes. And this landscape had major hydraulic interventions along the centuries by the Venetians. But what is probably less known is these landscapes were reclaimed at the beginning of the 20th century it implied a removal of water, the draining of the swamps and floodplains. And despite the major coastal and riverine protection works of the past, uh, these territories will once again and soon be repossessed by the sea. We could talk about a future palimpsest which goes back to the first century before Christ when the Adriatic Sea was much more extended what you see on the right, you see a red line. And actually this line represents the best scenario we could face of the change of this coastline. Of course, the line is, uh, is a convention of representation in maths, uh, since we, we do not have line, but these lines do, these areas do have a thickness. They are transitional areas in continuous transformation. I also like very much the word line because um, 
it comes uh, again uh, from uh, an agricultural root. Uh, it's actually flax, a flowering plant, uh, which is cultivated as food and used for textile. And usually a line is uh, defined as a long, thin mark on a surface. But how to decide this line? This is another image from Luigi Ghiri, and the title is Ask to the Fog. So how can you define the line in the fog? How it is going to change? Everything is uncertain. What is actually crucial, it's actually to decide and define this future red line. What I'm going to leave and what I'm going to preserve, who is going to decide? Is it just a matter of cost and benefit analysis? I really think that this line should be a product of a shared imagination because deciding what to keep and what to leave is a project, especially in places where there is no need for the fence, such as marginal landscapes. One of the study areas that I'm going to present is going to be the Po River and its landscapes. You have to know that uh, this is the longest river in Italy. It crosses four regions before flowing into the Adriatic Sea in a vast delta, which is located just below the Venetian Laguna. The Po Delta actually is constituted by numerous rivers and water basins, which crosses multiple regions, making also difficult to organize a single strategy, which is not looking only to the river, but also to its landscapes and people. And um, the, the shape of this line of the Po Delta has changed its physical structure over the millennia. It actually represents uh, an example of an active delta in continuous growth. The recent hydraulic structure is a consequence of uh, two major events. So on one hand, it's a natural event, which is the Ferrara earthquake, which occurred uh, more or less in 1570, and they changed the main river branch. And then a second intervention, which is an anthropic intervention, the Porto Viro cut, which was um, a large hydraulic work built by the Republic of Venice in 1604. With this intervention, Venetians diverted the flux of sediments to bury the ports of the southern states in a sort of sand war. You have to know that these areas were crucial. They were located uh, along the so-called salt route, and the Po River was a major transport system from the Adriatic Sea to the rich areas upstream of Milan and Brescia. I usually work with the entire class uh, for the investigation and involvement of the stakeholders. We talk to people, we envision together multiple scenarios, which are then developed by the single groups. And if you go on site, you realize today that the river is somewhat neglected. It became the backyard of a system of medium-sized cities of the Padanian Plain. And as you see, it's a marginal, slow landscape uh, when, where some little practices are actually happening. What is crucial of this place is that floods and subsidence are part of the history of the places. And the threats doesn't come only from the sea, but of course, uh, from upstream. Usually, when you have risks, you also have abandonment of places. They go together. And uh, most of the building typologies you find that are actually water related. The Po River lost up to 70% of its section in the part between Mantua and Piacenza due to land reclamation and embankments. These anthropic interventions implemented the risk of flooding, which is also increased by the lack of management of sediments. This picture was taken some years ago. But uh, on the other hand, uh, recently everything came out and uh, we realized that we had water scarcity. And it's not a new phenomenon at all in these areas. We know from studies on climate change that in recent decades, the northern regions along the Alps have been increasingly dry during the winters. Rain has become scarcer even in the spring, while temperatures are higher. And this year, in 2022, we arrived at a situation where these three elements combined at the same time 
they actually produce an extreme drought. Dry periods are becoming the new normal for people, but also for farmers. And you understand that this, uh, how climate change is affecting precipitation patterns around the world and the Padanian Plain. And also this means actually a change in our decision on what to do, which crops to plant, how much water to give them, and whether to abandon some fields altogether. Especially in the Po Delta, the salt water incursion actually is changing completely the farm-led situation. Water means also water quality, and uh, the river has areas of high criticality due to anthropogenic pressures, agricultural pollutants, but also urban wastewater. We are talking about a place which is mostly agriculture space. Uh, we have to remind that 30% of the national agricultural outputs is produced in the Po River Basin. And if you carefully look at these territories, you understand the textures and how these landscapes were formed along the years. But also, if you go on site, you testify the lack of biodiversity the over exploitation of the soil, the soil compassion, which increases the flooding and desertification phenomena as well. I want to remind you that the Po Valley is one of the less vegetated and most polluted areas in Europe. Agricultural industrial demand have led to throughout exploitation of this area by deforestation and urbanization. And its lack of forest and ecological connection have worsened the loss of biodiversity and many ecosystem services woods provide. Uh, there are some leftovers of woods, but of course it's very hard to find them. The vegetation is mostly constituted by monocultural poplar plantation next to the riverbed. This helps in absorbing the water during flooding events, but not the ecological biodiversity. And when you go to the Delta, you see a lot of fish farming activities. Uh, they are all present, but it's an economy in crisis for many several reasons. So the question is, uh, can we turn all these crises into opportunity? Can uh, we as designers uh, and educators instill hope for the development of projects with different scales uh, from regional projects to highly localized ones? I would like to mention just two scenarios for the Pearl River. Um, the first scenario actually looks at the materiality, uh, sand and salt lines. Historically, sand and salt were two key elements for this landscape. By exploiting this potential of sediments and salt currently seen at threats, the project plans to protect the territory from the risk of water changes and also to create a new identity in local economy that can give new life to the territory. Um, the first intervention, it actually has to happen upstream and consists in renaturalizing the riverbanks upstream, which al allows to allocate more water during flooding and to reduce risk of this phenomena happening, as well as to store water for dry periods. To give room for the river is a well-known strategy, but it's something to plan much more in advance. The second intervention, of course, has to deal with the coastline and uh, eventually increasing the dune system in order to, to, to work, to make them work as natural storm barrier using the sediments from the river that at the moment are not in use anymore. Soil salinization is going to be crucial in the future, especially in the Delta. And the idea here was instead of fighting it, we decided to accept it. We decided to imagine a different landscape, which is accepting salt as a resource. The Po River was, like we said before, one of the salt roads of this transport system for the Republic of Venice, which allowed to connect the Adriatic Sea to Milan and Brescia. So we planned a kind of multiple defense system for the sea level rise that will take into account soil salinization, 
The first defense system is actually to ri rise and enforce the existing coastal dune system, recycling the sediments that are accumulated along the Fall River. But then a second defense system can also plan to ra raise the existing levees, which surrounds fish farms of the Delta. And progressively, in the long term, we can think about or convert in some coastal agricultural fields into saline agriculture and eventually into salt ponds with time. We arrive to a new landscape and we try to adapt to, to a new economic system to adapt to soil salinity. Um, we cannot fight it for a long time, so we decide to accept the situation. The second scenario I'm going to present us to deal with forest lines. And uh, we try to make this image to, to, to change the imagery and to rethink about uh, all the Po Delta and the river as a forest. The Po River was once densely forested, we forgot it. Intensive agriculture and the lack of woods and ecology are widely observed today in the Padanian Plain. And if we actually go to, to, to some historic images, like in this case, this is an image from 1814, so it's not a long time ago, you clearly see that there was a wet forest in the Delta, but we forgot it. So this scenario tries to protect the territory from the sea level rise, starting from today, and trying to look at the existing Delta coastline and rethink again a multiple system of defense. On one hand, you need to reinforce the existing levees to the protect the urban centers, but then rethinking of linking the leftovers of the primordial forest to make a kind of forest line along uh, the areas and along uh, all the delta. So to connect what is there and to rethink. And of course, at a certain point, we can also think to reaccept the water and to accept the situation that probably we will lose some territory, we will lose some landscapes, and they are going to change. The work actually has to be done not only on the coast, like we said before, and but uh, above all in the water basin in the inland uh, the idea is to make use of trees both in active planting and in passive growth and uh, we try to envision many multiple strategies uh, the primary forest the productive biomass forest the phytoremediation flood management wetlands and riparian woods and uh, try to recover the idea of the piantata but uh, in a new way uh, what is the piantata for those who are not Italian? Um, the piantata actually was a traditional agroforestry system, which was part of the Padanian Plain. And that with the coming of mechanization of agriculture, it almost completely disappeared. Uh, wines were tied to elm, to willows, poplars, mulberry trees. And it was a very interesting system, ecologically uh, was working very well and it helped to, to absorb the water. Of course, we cannot go back to the old situation, but we have to reconstruct a new ecological network on what is left. This would help us to avoid desertification and limit in some way water peaks. The project tried to reuse uh, the, the the trees, both in active planting and passive growth, along the riparian woods, in some areas where we had uh, some wetlands. But also, we are trying to observe where some areas actually spontaneous vegetation occurred. And sometimes we also thought that to fence these areas from public access in order to let them grow. And um, the project actually start to, to look at what is there, connecting the system all together and to enhance also the touristic tourist systems. Uh, trees can be planted in many ways and uh, along the meanders to absorb more water, but also to include also some remains. Uh, there are many abandoned areas and sometimes these areas are accessible, sometimes are not. 
um, the proposal is applied in a sample area of 50 for 50 kilometers in the province of Ferrara. We tested in some way along the, it's an area where um, it does have a high risk flood zone and several abandoned agricultural fields and post industrial lands. Tree and plants samples are recorded, strategically planned to carry out phytoremediation on contaminated soil. And abandoned areas are classified and repurposed with increased ecological and landscape value. And the plan is developed in phases, monitored, adjusted until the year 2100. To further enhance uh, the value of the landscape, uh, slow mobility is suggested. We tested another smaller area, the entrance of Ferrara, looking at the existing forest, uh, uh, planning some productive forest and implementing the piantata in a new way. And uh, we also rethought actually some water treatment along these uh, slow mobility uh, paths. Uh, and uh, of course, wood topology would need to be updated and changed with time, also in consideration to climate. At the end of this route, we examined uh, some leftovers. In this case, you see the Ridania X distillery. It was uh, it is actually next to the center of Ferrara. And we try to look at uh, the soil contaminants uh, using the plants uh, for phyto and micro remediation, but also rethinking the space as a park, but looking at the traces that we could find. So the project tries actually to look at the palimpses, the remaining structures, and make it the most from what we found, uh, trying to sue the parts that we saw. And uh, sometimes uh, some parts of the parks are accessible, some other parts are fenced in a sort of reserve. With time, this, this landscape changes and progressively through different techniques uh, can be renaturalized. And the master plan does have a longer period of time in terms of growth. Some uh, particular areas are actually accessible by population, and some fetal testing gardens are planned. Uh, implementation of smaller scale stone water treatment devices are aimed to educate the public regarding the use of rainwater. And some parts are instead, you know, some kind of fur landscape that is left like it is in a sort of reserve of what we found there. Um, the second sample that I want to show you is uh, actually another area which is called the Bassa Friulana. Uh, it is located upper north of Italy and faces the Marano Lagoon. So we are located the, uh, upper north to the Venetian Lagoon. And uh, as usually, we started actually having a very strong part in research trying to investigate this territory of the Bassa Friulana through the development of territorial maps and understanding the historical formation from the water system, the city, the forest, the infrastructure. What comes out is this territory of the Lower Friuli is partly a new product. It is a recent product. It is mainly the result of the 20th century reclamation when land was taken from the sea. It is a territory that is dominated by agriculture, but what is probably not visible, it is a territory that for a long time, again, it was dominated by woods, and where the fragments tell what remains of an ancient primary forest, but nowadays in some way it is neglected. Historical maps are crucial to understand uh, envisioning the future, but also understanding how this, this land was actually dominated by water in the past. And uh, we encountered again hydrologic risk coming upstream and from the sea, as well as we have to face seawater intrusion phenomena in the coming years. Beyond the rich Roman remains, we also have the city of Palmanova, the area has today many recently abandoned buildings. Mainly the abandonment is due to immigration that came in the 70s for military purposes. And now the majority of military spaces look vacant. 
So again, uh, uh, where to start to give identity, promote territory in crisis? Uh, the studio worked uh, again on scenarios and tried to strengthen the existing microeconomies uh, and sometimes to reinforce uh, Latin, eco Latin economies that can become important development factors for these areas. We try to start from the leftovers uh, from what is there. The first scenario focuses on climate change and this acceptance of water. We have not to forget uh, that all these areas are actually based on a complex system of hydraulic pumps. So if we are not going to work, actually, this is the scenario that we are going to face. Not to mention the salt intrusion phenomena that will lead to an increase in the salinity of the land and to a progressive impoverishment of agricultural production. So we try to take advantage of the environmental condition, also defending from the sea and transforming some farms into fishing farms and progressively strengthening these microeconomies that necessarily will have to change because the topologies are not going to work in the future. The second scenario, again, looks at the forest and looks in, imagines the Bassa Friulana as a park. Um, coastal protection is implemented by this forest city. It can be actually uh, built uh, uh, in, as an ecological resource, as an, a social economic resource. It is a forest uh, that has different thicknesses, uh, productive forests such as poplar groves implemented by new agroforestry system, existing plain forest, phytoremediation woods. They have to adapt uh, to the different pedology of the soil and this is actually crucial for the present, but also for the future. Uh, while we were also studying these landscapes, uh, we actually found out that uh, during uh, the Austria-Hungarian Empire, many activities of the sites were dealing with flower industry. And uh, so we start thinking, uh, can we think an economy of colors? trying to deliver a strong identity to the site and to adapt to this flower economy, to the changing climate and the salinity of the soil. Can we think about water resistant flowers or so resistant flowers? Can we imagine the city as a flower? Can we start from the existing activities to rethink and reuse the site also in the very short term period? <clears throat> Flower production, it's an economy that can easily uh, achieved, uh, can also include phytoremediation, soil pollutant, tolerant flowers. And so we started uh, looking and going back with this image of the Bassa Friulana. Um, when I work with uh, students, uh, their research part plays a very important role. And then their design comes out usually with the definition of scenarios and going down to scale. But most of the times we include a lot of stakeholders. We include regional authorities, municipalities, farmers, but sometimes it's uh, not enough. So we try to, to do and to go to make some little installation to involve the public, uh, the people of this land, to make them aware and part of the future decisions that necessarily has be to, to be thought and taken. For example, here we draw, the idea was to draw the future, so to draw the new coastline or to reframe the sea and the points of view that are going to change in the very near future, or sometimes to frame other areas that, again, they're going to be affected by climate change. And we go on site. Over here, some of the installation focused instead on the forest line to make people aware that maybe a second line of defense can also start with the rebuilding of the forest or also enhancing the ecological corridors of the area. Um, I would like to end the presentation with a quote by Pablo Picasso to stress the fact that uh, this uncertain coastal and riverine line 
has to be imagined and uh, co-designed with local population and uh, local regional authorities. It will be a very difficult process, but a necessary one, especially in rural marginal areas where sometimes there is not the economic convenience of defending the land. There is nothing more difficult than a line. Thank you for listening. Some of the publication we're done some last year are available online. And next year it's coming out of this work with Routledge. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura, for this excellent presentation. And I found it uh, particularly inspiring and stimulating both from the point of view of uh, the research methodology, but also from the point of view of the planning design and design uh, through the scale uh, uh, dimension. So thank you very much. And now the, the floor is uh, for Antonio Longo, our discussant. Thank you very much. Uh, I try to be brief and uh, some consideration in the questions. And I anticipate, Laura, that my question maybe is a little bit out of the topic of the landscape, but is, uh, uh, in fact, it is, uh, because it's about the representation. Uh, all your drawings or your maps uh, are absolutely beautiful. And uh, uh, the narrative and the presentation uh, that you did, that is, it's possible uh, also in the continuity through different uh, case study, different project, uh, thanks uh, to the, the, the quality of the drawing and the uh, intentional aesthetic of the drawings. But before then, uh, two short considerations, which are in fact related with this power of the, of the maps of, the, of your drawings. The first is that you're working on historical landscape that um, necessarily uh, opened the idea of the relationship with the history as a matter of conservation. All is in evolution and all is in a dramatic evolu evolution or in a normal evolution because the history of this place is quite short, in fact is in a history that deal with in a uh, human horizon and sometime in a very recent one, like the free will. As in other part uh, is, more, is more old, but uh, the transformation that you describe is uh, quite uh, uh, modern. And the, in this sense, uh, every uh, idea of the future uh, in some way have to be related with the horizon of the past we should have the same uh, transformation, radical transformation in a short future, 15, 100, 115 years than we had in the past. And this is not so impossible, probably. And this gives our, the, the, the dimension of the challenge you have, also in uh, rethinking and in the resetting in a very brave way, the sense of the history of the territorial palimpsest we have. The second things, and uh, also related with the uh, with the uh, with the representation, with maps, drawings, and um, also um, image uh, of picture views. Some of them are uh, from important authors. Uh, is the political power of the landscape in terms of uh, visibility of this change. Uh, it's obvious that this kind of transformation, more than uh, the challenge in terms of uh, landscape architecture and so, are uh, have, have a dramatic consequence on the life of the people, on the local economies, in the balance of the uh, coastal and internal uh, region and area, um, in the quality of the uh, environment and the, also the equilibrium, the hydro hydrological equilibrium with the cities we have in the coast. So what, why landscape is so important? Because it, it's evident that only in a landscape as point of view in a very traditional sense, uh, make understandable let to understand to the local community the situation and the problem and the challenges show or make visible 
but to understand the landscape in terms of uh, necessary and possible evolution. So in this uh, term, uh, more than uh, uh, environmental arguments or technical arguments, the power of the landscape is absolutely uh, great and necessary in some way. Uh, I would say that uh, in Italy, where the extreme phenomena you explain it, but are so diffused in different ways, uh, probably uh, we, we need a uh, landscape approach to the environmental problem more and more. And now it's not so. Sometimes we, we, we cover the landscape, we, we miss the landscape. We don't explain the, the real consequences in terms of landscape of the environmental change. And finally, my question uh, directly. Um, about the representation. Uh, your representation is beautiful and in some way uh, aristocratic. And uh, um, I know that probably is also related with the beauty of the books that you are doing. But my question is uh, how you can uh, um, translate or move or interpret your capacity in drawings uh, with the previous consideration. So the relationship between environmental and landscape issues and the uh, dimension of the evolution of the palisades, which is time. Because the only one thing that I would say I don't find so much in your beautiful drawings uh, is the dimension of the time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Antonio, for pointing out this on representation. Uh, to me, it is crucial. Um, how do we represent the land? Uh, there is an interesting quote from Corbeau that he says uh, to, that maps are a way to understand the land, but also to transform it. And this is very true because it's a matter of understanding how things are going, but also how do we imagine these places are going to change? And who is going to be my public? And uh, this is very true. It's probably aristocratic uh, when I talk to the academia and drawings are technically drawn. It's less as aristocratic if you are dealing with the public and sketching together in workshops where you are actually working lively on the landscape. So it's a language, representation in the language, and it depends on the people we are talking to. And I think this is crucial in every setting, uh, in every situation. And this is something that I try to achieve. Uh, there is uh, a facade, which is the representation facade of the, the final drawings that are projecting, let's say, the future or ideas. And there is the sketch. There is uh, the, the map uh, with the stakeholders in which everybody is saying his point of view. So I agree uh, on uh, the aristocratic image, but there is also the other side. What is crucial, you talk about the concept of time. And it's something that uh, also I reflect uh, pretty often, especially dealing with the Italian context. And nowadays I'm dealing instead with the Netherlands so, and in the past I've been working in other places. And the concept of time is something that is very diverse uh, from population to population. I would say that Italians do have an inertia. Uh, we do have this kind of inertia that prevents us to go ahead and uh, to imagine a future. We have such a long history that for us, uh, it's very difficult to forget the past and uh, and probably we would need much more centuries to adapt to the imagery of changing this line. And so uh, what to do? What can we do? I think uh, we can't do much. Uh, we can warn people, we can make aware, but I understand that uh, the only situation that can change things is dealing with two factors, the emergency and this we are actually the the, the masters in emergencies that are becoming actually, actually permanent. And then secondly, I would say that um, it's also dealing with economy. 
if you show that there is something convenient, then people will think about, start thinking about at least, you know. But Italians do deal with this inertia. And for us, it's very difficult. We are going to take actions. We know the situation. We know what was going to come. But to act is very, very different and very difficult. Representing time, um, it's also an issue and it depends again on what you want to represent, um, which is going to be your time scale. Uh, for such phenomena, sometimes you need a very long term, 2100, 2050, maybe even more if you want to look at the geological time of the transformation of the Adriatic Sea on what's going, to on, going on. But then uh, also the very short time is crucial again, uh, because we have to fight against this inertia, which is typical Italian, especially in relation to time. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, maybe I don't know if I answer to all of your questions, but I'm ready <laughs> to, to answer to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. I think that we can open the discussion. Connor. So thank you, Laura, for an excellent paper. I'd like to join with Antonio in thanking you for it. I found it quite aristocratic as well, but not <laughs> in any exclusive sense. It was a, it was a Rolls Royce of a paper, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, I'm very interested in the question from Antonio and the, the implications of that around communicating a vision. Um, your, your observation of the Italians particularly suffering from an inertia, um, it, that's not unique to the Italians. And maybe you've been living in the Netherlands for too long where people seem to be able to react uh, en masse um, to these issues uh, much more quickly. But this sense of how to bring your public along with you um, and the processes of consultation, we've all been involved, I think almost everyone here in the room, as it were, has been has faced this challenge of how to bring the general public along on a plan that's ambitious and yet vital. Um, it's against the backdrop of an emergency. I described it earlier on as an existential crisis. And I thought that it was very interesting your, um, your the capturing of the historical continuum. I think that's very important because I think that people attach themselves to place through history quite often. Um, and in my experience, I guess this notion of sensitivity to local history opens people's hearts and minds to the project at hand. And I'm wondering in your experience whether there is um, a sense among the public who will be affected by um, this plan in the same way as they will be, they are being affected right now by climate change and all of those impacts, whether they have um, there's an evolution in the sense of moving from being the inheritors of history to the makers of history. Mm. Um, so the adoption of this plan um, shifts the actor from, I suppose, in one sense, um, the passive inheritor of history to the sense that they are now making a new history in a landscape that has been historically quite dynamic. I know the timelines are probably longer than people's lives, but nonetheless, it is a landscape that has seen an awful lot of change. Um, and I'm wondering whether you have any um, sense that this is um, a motif that people are attracted uh, to. No, thank you, Connor, for this, this uh, interesting question. Now, make here, to be a maker of a new landscape, instead of being a passive, uh, passively inheriting a landscape. Um, I think people are very much 
attaches to solid stuff, uh, to buildings, uh, to some symbols of permanence, uh, rather than to landscapes. So it's very difficult to justify, actually, to how how and why you go back to the past, especially in dealing with landscape history. We are talking about vegetation, we are talking about sediments that are constantly changing, the coastline are constantly changing, they are part of history. So uh, to make them aware um, of being a new maker is very difficult. So, uh, even though it's not impossible, if you tell them the story, then look, there was something different beforehand. We cannot really go back to that because it's a past that is already past. But maybe we can be maker of a new past that is going to be renewed. Well, it's more accepted, I would say, rather than starting from something that we start from scratch. And uh, especially, I would say, from the cultural point of view, especially with Italians, uh, I tell you this and the concept of time and change uh, depends really on your cultural background. Uh, I say, I say, I see in the Netherlands a very different attitude on making new landscapes. They are very much used to do that. Uh, and if you go to Singapore, I was even shocked that basically every year you're going to find a different landscape, which is constantly changing and everything, everything happened more or less in 50 years. So they are so used to changes that for them, it's quite a necessity, I would say. So the concept of, uh, of making a history, um, uh, probably in Italians, you know, this inertia is something that is progressively building on. But if we go back and we renew the, the old image, it works better. It might work better. I don't see Connor anymore, but maybe there are some other questions from the public or from Tessa. I don't know if anyone has uh, other question. We can also write them down on the chat. Wama, maybe you, you want to add something or uh, ask something to Laura. Oh, only congratulations, Laura. <laughs> so, so, uh, and um, marvelous, marvelous lecture, very interesting. I, I, I only remember because I, I work, I worked many years in the, in the research group in Venice about Delta del Po for the fisherman, so for the fisher, and to have the possibility to control all the water there. But I think your contribution are very, very hard, very important. So I think it's one uh, methodology very interesting in the in that case of river. I think one of the questions more important for me after your presentation that maybe it's necessary to do some synthetic form to understand the landscape, the point of the landscape for the river and how the river has the possibility to recognize many of the, our territory and many of our, many of our culture. How is possible to understand this today about this? I think it's one of the conditions, really, really interesting. I think you show exactly the possibility to introduce this methodology. And really, really congratulations. But I think we need, I, I wait this book and I would like to know a little more, uh, more quietly and more specific uh, place about your research. Uh, uh, in our case, I, I I would like, uh, I, I, I have in my mind many other research about the Po, no? uh, about the, the many, many questions. Uh, so this is not only one seminary. I think you have the possibility to connect all of them with, the, uh, with your idea. And I think, again, thank you very much. And I think it's one of the best research I, I never uh, seen about the Po and about the Sun River. Thank you again. Thank you, Juan. And you mentioned a very interesting point that maybe the river should talk, you know, uh, not only us, so the anthropocentric image uh, sometimes That's right. shift That's right. also 
from uh, you know from what's coming next or from what the sediments are saying or what the nature is telling us and uh, and that's even more crucial yeah i see the hand raised from uh, rita Kyuto. thank you thank you tessa uh thank you very much uh, to laura for this marvelous uh, uh, lecture um i'm i'm pleased to to um uh, hear uh, from uh, a lecture that uh, underline uh, the necessity to uh, refer to the drawing uh, the necessity to refer uh, to the line as as a way to writing uh, uh, the history of uh, uh, the the fundamental element of uh, landscape. Um, uh, there, there are a very, very uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, your lecture um, uh, um, touch, and uh, um, maybe uh, um, I, I, um, I would like to to underline the uh, question. Uh, you have choose a different way to draw. Uh, you choose uh, the language of the, the technical uh, uh, drawing, but also uh, you have also different references of uh, representation there are of the domain, of the, the artistic domain. Um, I think that uh, it is a, a choice that uh, represents um, uh, the complexity of the landscape and the complexity to, uh, to talk about that. But um, uh, I have a question uh, about this. Uh, if in your work, have you... Um, have you um, uh, I don't know, uh, experiment, uh, um, the most important results uh, to, uh, to talk with uh, people with uh, 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 in using uh, technical uh, representation and uh, some, something that could refer to practical uh, elements of the territory of the, the landscape. Of uh, or, or, or if you um, uh, experiment uh, more important results uh, in uh, in talking with people uh, in using uh, the the artistic uh, representation um, uh, some. Uh, some elements about uh, the the interest of people and the way to uh, that uh, the way that they prefer or they that they that people can uh, better understand. Uh, thank you, Rita, for this question. Um, yeah, definitely yes, because when uh, when you have this kind of uh, participatory meetings, uh, people feel a little bit embarrassed, I would say, in drawings. They don't feel like capable of transforming, even doing a line, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you mm -hmm. present them the autophoto, the tracing paper, and they feel not completely confident. Uh, what works very well sometimes is actually the models. And uh, they feel yeah. more comfortable uh, to to touch things and the materiality of uh, you know of, of really understanding uh, the site and moving the objects. Uh, but for them, it's also crucial. So this is a way in which actually participatory models can work very well, also in a very short period of time when you have to meet all these stakeholders. Uh, and when you go then to the orthophoto, actually they feel more confident and they actually, it's a, it's a pleasure to work with people because they tell you a lot of things. They indicate where there is a site, where you have to go, where they understand and know the landscape better than us. So they are the teachers. <laughs> and, uh, and they don't, probably don't represent mostly with drawing, but maybe they prefer models to transform these places. 
uh, some people are working with digital models and digital tools. I would say that uh, they are pretty uncomfortable when you're working with stakeholders because um, it's more difficult. So the materiality of things does matter. So touch <laughs> and move. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that Antonio raised his hand. Yes, yes. I, I, I would like to say something um, about, again, about the representation. Uh, and uh, because I, I really believe uh, that uh, uh, working on the representation, although in a very transdisciplinary way, is the necessary way to, to uh, make. Uh, uh, let me say that the landscape uh, uh, useful. So in terms to mm, really give the power to the landscape, which is uh, most potential than expressed. Um, I have an obsession and uh, Laura know this obsession because we discussed it this summer, but um, the, the work you are doing, the cover is beautiful. Um, is similar, or remember to me, uh, a work of a uh, German, uh, not exactly graphic designer, but uh, uh, she designed book, book designer, which is also one of the most famous novelists and writer in, uh, in Germany. And the name is Judith Schalansky. And uh, she wrote many beautiful books about literature and maps. One is about Forgotten Island, and the other is having a little tale is a is a um, catalogo di alcune cose perdute. So in English, I don't know. Is a Verzeichnis einige Verluste in German in the original language. I don't know how is this translated in, in English. But in this book is a, a wonderful description of the wetland, of the lagoon, of the creek, uh, of the Harbour of Greisman, uh, the city of uh, Kaspar David Friedrich, where all the landscape changed, uh, and also the representation of the place was destroyed, the original paintings of Kaspar David Friedrich, uh, in an, uh, um, by the bombs in 43, uh, when uh, a lot of other countries were destroyed by the bomb, the American bombs in the German city. And this description use the literature together with the image uh, in, a, in a specific way, telling maps and include in the description of the maps, which is a paradox because she know exactly how she can do in maps. Uh, also some ecological description, some historical description, description, the description of the sensations. So it's fully landscape. And uh, so I think uh, mixing the way to represent landscape and in this turn opening the question of the representation of the landscape and the question of the landscape to many different disciplines, mm -hmm. to many different knowledge and giving uh, or representing the landscape itself as a big clearing in a forest where the ecology is visible is I think the most important thing we can do. Yeah, and this, this is uh, exactly the work you are opening also with your work. Yeah, I, I don't know if Antonio know that my uh, graduation thesis was actually dealing with literature with uh, on the city of Lisbon. Maybe some of you would read actually this book, which is still online after 20 years. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, the idea there was actually uh, to talk about the city with no images. You open this book, you don't see any kind of image, just readings. I've been reading all the history of uh, and the, the, you know, the city of Lisbon and all the imagery of the city of Lisbon. And uh, I tried to represent what I could see in the landscape changes through the, the words through the words. So not even uh, looking at physical object or physical images, but to work on the imagery itself. And it really helps. Uh, it really helps in envisioning also a future. And uh, the Paul uh, actually is one of those places uh, that it will be very interesting to do this exercise. Uh, 
next time we'll do it together, I hope. <laughs> there is also a, a series of questions on the chat, but the, the person, Gwenel Kot, uh, has left. So okay. we can take <laughs> them to <laughs> for the future. I don't know if um, anybody else uh, has a questions or consideration remarks no maybe not so uh connor uh, i think i think you can uh, officially close this session also relaunching for the the next uh, meeting yes so once again thank you Lara, um, from the comments, I don't know whether you've had a chance, you've been answering questions, but just looking at the comments that have come in in the chat, um, uh, the very positive remarks on uh, the caliber and the quality of the presentation. Uh, I'd like to join with Juan Manuel in saying um, that this is the clearest, um, the clearest enunciation on the issues facing the Po Valley uh, that I've ever heard. So it really makes sense um, of it. It's a, a huge challenge, um, but you've matched that extremely well. And your choice of respondent is excellent too, to, um, uh, to have a respondent that understands what you're doing and gets uh, what you're saying. I see another um, compliment coming in from Andrea Galli down there. So many compliments to Lara for this presentation. Uh, I think there might be a question built into that. So let me just very quickly open up the full thing. Um, okay, so I know we're kind of in the closing part, but Andrea, you've slipped in now with the last question. So did you find local farmers really available to change their way to make agriculture? Because this is necessary, I guess, to implement your master plan. So I'll allow you to answer that question and then we'll wrap things up. Um, unfortunately, not at, uh, not mm, not all of them. Uh, however, would I remind a nice uh, farmer in not in the Po Valley but in the other side, the Bassa Fiulana, who is actually working also on an artistic intervention in the landscape. And also, she came to Venice and she participated uh, in the, all the workshops. So there are people who are sensitive. On, um, on rethinking and uh, putting in practice also very simple ideas that can actually reinforce the imagery and, uh, and let things happen, let's say like that. So some of them are very, are very sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. I'm struck immediately in your response uh, by, I guess, my own... Um, prediction, I guess, I, I assumed you were going to refer to the farmer as a he, but the fact that it's a she, in my experience, female farmers are much more open to change uh, than their male counterparts. And so this in and of itself is possibly a good note uh, to end our session on. Um, so to thank you and everybody else for attending and just to remind you that the next and final talk in the series is on the 25th uh, of October notification will go out in due course when Stefano Tornieri uh, from um, uh, where's Stefano from I'm trying to remember university. Okay, thank you. Um, and he's going to be talking on the medial environments and new generations of infrastructure. Um, so again, picking up the, the theme of this lecture series or seminar series, which is landscape and sustainability. Um, and uh, you will be a hard act to follow, Laura, but um, we look forward uh, to seeing you and everybody else back on the 25th of October. So thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Safe home if you're traveling. And um, if we can do a silent round of applause for uh, for Laura, thank you. thank you very much.